Ephesians chapter 4 somehow meets Ezekiel 37. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. I'm the author of the Supernatural Christian book, which chronicles my supernatural experiences before and after meeting Jesus. It's called Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey. Um, I have a passion for lighting and stoking the fires of revival. Today we're going to be talking about Speaking the truth in love is how this started. I did a Periscope about it, and um, I'm going to talk some more because this subject isn't finished. And I want to tell you you something interesting here. I have been watching this doctrine come together for almost a year now. And for those of you that don't know, God has has an interesting way about him. Proverbs 25.2 says, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. God has a way of sewing together a message over time through many people, and the puzzle finally comes together. We all know that that scripture in Corinthians where we prophesy in part. If, one, if something is revealed to one brother, you know, let the other one hold his peace until he's through, and then let the other one talk. And I'll, I've noticed that in those type of settings, you know, one person might get the vision, one person might get the inter- interpretation, or, you know, like tongues. Somebody might speak in tongues, and then there might be somebody to interpret it. It's the same thing with the prophetic in this New Testament dispensation, Okay. Um, we're all putting together a piece of the puzzle, and as we go, as we meditate, the pieces of the puzzle comes together, and I've been watching this come together over quite some time uh, through several different people. There are certain people with, that when they post something, I know they're hearing from God, and I read it. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, this is coming together, and it, it's it's really interesting, too, the way God does that. When God, you know, surely he does nothing except he reveals it to his servants, the prophets, that which is in Amos. He has this way in this New Testament of throwing waves of revelation out. That's why I say rocks of revelation being poured out. Um, who's going to catch these waves? And I see I've had dreams over a decade about how prophets of God, uh, pastors and teachers or you know, people like that, people in the ministry that are seeking God, they're on the ocean, they've got their, their surfboards, and uh, some of them are looking at the land, they're looking the wrong way, and the others are, are looking uh, on the horizon for the wave to come up, you know, so they can get in position to catch the wave and ride the wave. I mean, it, I, that's what I've been seeing. And I've also had that vision last week about how God is pouring liquid gold into the mold, and it's going into the teacher's and the pastor's position. So there's going to be something purified. A pure doctrine is going to be spilled out from heaven into the mold of the church, and I believe it's going to start going to the the te- teachers and the pastors where it's extremely deficient. I mean, you know, guys, I, I hate to keep harping on this, but the more and more you read your Bible— the more and more that the lies are exposed. I mean, all you got to do is kind of just sit there and read the Bible and go, you know what? Well, that part that I've heard there is not true. That TV show, that's wrong. I mean, so, you know, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And uh, because you rejected knowledge, I'll reject you. That's basically what, what the, the passage says in Hosea 4, 6. And I've been getting the revelation on Psalm fifty sixteen and 17 
But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in my mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction and cast thy words behind me? So we're in an important time. This 21-day fast that's going on right now, it's kind of going to reveal which side of the word if are we going to come on? Which side of the word if in Second Chronicles 7.14 in the challenge, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, that's this 21-day fast, right? And turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Okay, so turning from our wicked ways is kind of where this came from. When I was talking about the uh, the periscope that I did recently, I'm talking about speaking the truth in love. And I've been praying, I've been praying to the Lord about, you know, how do we do how do we speak the truth in love? Because those of us that read the Bibles, you know, in the spirit of truth guides us into all truth, there are some doctrines that simply just leap off the page and you go, you know what? That's wrong, that's wrong, and that's wrong, but everybody's doing it, and you're sitting here like going, you know. Lord, what am I supposed to do? You know, I'm not in a position of authority. I'm not, you know what I'm saying? So there's lots of facets to speaking the truth in love. And I wanted to, I wanted to read something kind of, you may think this is weird, but there's a part where we, where we sin in ignorance back in Leviticus. This is a a book written to the, to the priests. And we're supposed to change things like Leviticus 4, 2 through 4. Speaking and speaking to the children of Israel, saying, "If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do any, uh, shall do against any of them, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin which he has sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering." And then he talks about how he shall bring the bullock into the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. You know, it's before the whole congregation shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. So sometimes, you know, there's people that can sin, the priests can sin, and then they kind of do the whole thing in front of the congregation and they repent, right? So there are times that we can sin in ignorance. It's not just me and you. In other words, we're doing a sin, and it's in the Bible, and then we read it, and we go, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. That is such and such. That is such, like, that's idolatry, or that's fornication. I didn't know I couldn't do that, you know, that type of thing. And the way that works is the Spirit of truth will guide us into all truth, plus the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. There's this There's this walk that we take in our sanctification in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, which I've been talking about for a few months. What happens is this. Once... God grants us repentance in an area of our life, and we know the truth. Jesus says you will know the truth. The truth will make you free. Then you're made free. You have the sword of the Spirit. You are equipped to overcome in that area, and you can overcome the devil at that point where he used to take you captive at his will. He took advantage of our ignorance. He took advantage of our apathy. The devil comes in and takes advantage of of the things that, you know, kind of kind of like we dug our own hole. You know, we, we dug our our hole of uh, alcohol and drugs. You know, we kind of, we, we started digging that when we had our first beer. You know what I'm saying? It just starts, and then the hole gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Pretty soon we've dug such a deep hole on the way to hell, we're looking up and we can't get out. And there's a light, and we have to reach up and say, Lord, save me. So now... In our process of sanctification, we are becoming meat for the master's use. We're not not so much interested in just getting inside the door of salvation. We're interested in getting people on fire for Jesus. Okay, so what happens at this point, we all of a sudden, as we read the Bibles, we grow in our relationship with the Lord, we listen to the Holy Spirit, because the same Spirit of truth that, that quickens the Scriptures for us as we read them, He shows us things to come. Pretty soon, He gives us a dream in the night, it happens the next day, and you're like, oh my gosh, my relationship with the Lord is strengthening and growing. I'm going from the relationship of goo-goo-ga-ga talk as a baby, to now I understand the, the articulate voice of the Lord. So now, we're at this point. We're at this point, and then we go, oh my gosh, there's sin in 
the church. There is sin in people that I love's life. So what do we do? But I want to let you know, even, even Paul, in his letter to Timothy, you know, we've got to remember, Paul was a sinner. He was a murderer for, for, for uh, God. <laughs> he thought he was. Remember when he was persecuting Christians, using the Bible to do so? Remember that? He's talking to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 14. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus." Amen. So he did it ignorantly and in unbelief. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? Paul was ignorant of the truth. He was zealous for God. He was zealous for God. And I want you to, un- I want you to get this concept as well. People that are zealous for God, God gives a lot of grace to, even if their theology isn't all that in a bag of chips. I've seen it over and over and over again. Um, you know, they may, they're just not is mighty in the scriptures. But but Jesus, if you remember, he anointed the apostles with power before they before they graduated seminary, right? Even in Acts it says they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they had been with Jesus. It's more important to be with Jesus and, and demonstrate the things of power of the kingdom of God. You know, casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead. That is what Jesus did. And this type of ministry is what caused people to become Christians. The people didn't become Christians because of eloquent arguments. People did not become Christians. At this time, Nero was lighting Christians on fire just, just because his garden needed light at night. He would light Christians up on the road. So, you know, that's that. Now, I want you to understand. Would you become a Christian... Just because you heard some good preaching with some really good intellectual points and persuasive points, or would you be be persuaded, you know, to become a Christian because it was demonstrated in power? Paul says, you know, I don't come at you with eloquent words, but in the demonstration of power. Okay, so this this is what charged people up to become Christians. Let that sink in. Paul was zealous. He was zealous towards God. He thought he was doing something great for God, and God gave him grace. Then he finally said, you know what? Here you go. Meet Jesus. Let's go. And then Paul walked in the power, supernatural power. All that intellectual text stuff that he knew, sitting at the feet of Gamaliel and all that stuff, didn't do him any good. He couldn't heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, until he met Jesus and had the power of the kingdom. You know, he met Jesus. That's the important thing, meeting Jesus. Everybody, it's so frustrating. The big thrust of the Internet is intellectual wrangling. And, you know, how did they put all those animals on the boat? You know, everybody's living in the devil's playground, which is rationale. You know, rationale, has God said. Someone's living in that area of doubt and unbelief. And instead of going out and demonstrating the love of Jesus... You know, and it happens. The love of Jesus works today through people. And I know people. Gary Nesbitt's one of them. He goes around and people get healed. You know, I mean, people get healed. I pray for him. And he has some testimonies on his Facebook page, a video, you know. So that is happening today. So how do we get from uh, Ephesians 4, meeting Ezekiel 37, and how do we get that speaking the truth in love? I'm going to show you how. Now, we had dinner with um, Gary and Nancy, and she, she had started sharing a revelation that's actually a part of this whole tapestry that, that the Lord has been sewing together in my life, probably before April 11th of last year, but I had that vision about Ephesians 4.11 on April 11th last year, and that was pretty powerful. Yeah, but but God was working on that doctrine before this. And remember, it's a, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of kings to seek it out. This is why we pray things through. We stick with it. We pray it through. We don't just go, oh, I had a vision. That's so nice. Remember after Peter 
after Peter had the vision three times of the blanket coming down out of heaven, saying, rise, rise, Peter, kill and eat, he meditated on it, and he knew later, after he chewed on it, that, <laughs> chewed on it, that's funny, that he was supposed to preach to the Gentiles. Okay, so we pray things through. We stay in constant fellowship with the Spirit of God. Now, um, she came to a revelation about how there needs to be a shaking first, um, before the the bones can come together in Ezekiel 37. And I'm like, going, hmm, all right, that sounds pretty good. And I notice that there needs to be a noise before that. And this is how prophetic revelation works. We know about the Valley of Dry Bones. God says to Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And he said, I know, God knows, I, I don't know. And he said to me, prophesy unto these dry bones. Now I want you to understand, the Lord told Ezekiel, to prophesy. Ezekiel did not prophesy without authorization of the Lord. He didn't know what to do, but God told him. Now, I want you to understand, when we prophesy, when we operate in the prophetic, we better be hearing from God, right? That's the deal. We need to have a relationship. Can't prophesy out of our heart. We can't prophesy witchcraft. You know, we got to prophesy what the Lord says. That's all we say, right? He said, prophesy to these bones, and saying to them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and you will bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So kind of like Adam, you know, Adam was molded out of the clay, and then God breathed in him, and it could live. So he prophesied in 37.7, and there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and then the bones came together. So I'm, I'm in the revelation right now that the prophetic word of the Lord needs to be noised in order for the church to truly rise up and to come together. You know, we're looking at it as a valley of dry bones. It's in extreme disarray right now. It's scattered all over the place. Um, the remnant, you know, that we're seeing with the microchurches on Periscope, they're scattered all over the place. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So here we go. There needs to be a prophetic noise and then a shaking. Now, um, Gary sent me a teaching, and this is pretty pretty awesome, dude. I, I forget who it was right now. Um, I may find it in a minute. But this lady said, you know, there's always a noise and a shaking, like an earthquake or something. And I watched this YouTube video, and she says, every time that happens, there's a message. So what she did on her YouTube video, she found every time that God showed up, there was a, a time of God, there was extreme noise, and there was an extreme shaking, and then there was a message, right? So I'm like going, man, this is really good. This doctrine is being sewed together over months, and I'm excited to be a part of it. So now, we just read a little bit about Ezekiel 37. Let's let's tie this in to Ephesians 4.11 and see what God's up to. Hi, this is Jessica Gutierrez from RenewedVisionMinistry.org, and you are having Coffee with Conrad. Is your phone smart? Get the Conrad Rocks app. Listen anytime, listen everywhere. Come see that the Lord is good. Come see that His love endures. Come see. this came as I was asking the Lord, how do we speak the truth in love, right? And dude, I'm going to tell you, people came in Periscope when I was originally talking about this, and I'm like going, you know, this guy said, there is this uh, doctrine, blah, 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 and I'm like going, man, God is talking at this precise moment because we're going to even deal with that. It's part of God's message. This guy coming into Periscope at that precise time was part of the message. I mean, it's time to get excited, people. God is speaking during this 21-day fast, amen? So remember, I was praising God and asking him about how do we speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.11, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Remember that? That's the vision. That's what I had uh, back on April 11th about Ephesians 4.11, and all that other stuff happened. The computer 
turned on and played the video. Remember, I, I had to emergency do a video back then. Pretty awesome. Just go back to the blog. Then it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Right? These offices are for the perfecting of the saints. Perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. They're not to be exalted and say, look at me, (laughs) I'm a prophet. It's for work. We're here to get things done. Then it says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and to the measure of the the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, this is John 17. Jesus prayed that we become one. Ezekiel 37 is wanting wanting to prophesy that the exceedingly great army stands up as one, that we all work together in unity of the faith. Isn't that interesting? Then it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning of craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. Guys, Do you get what the Bible is saying here? This is what God is saying. The offices of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are to build up the church, build up the the saints for the ministry, and keep them from being tossed to and fro with these false doctrines that are flying everywhere. They're just everywhere, and they're taking advantage of of the sheep, right? These... um, they're being tossed to and fro by the slight of men and cunning craft, craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, these people are lying in wait to deceive. We see it all the time. It's to make money. Basically, they're serving their belly, and they don't really care about eternal life. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body jointly fit together. Doesn't this sound like Ezekiel 37? and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. So as I was digging to look for the treasure of how to speak the truth in love, I stumbled upon across this tapestry of the doctrine that God is weaving together. He's throwing this football right now that has to do with the church. It was crippled back in um, 411 of 2015. Remember, I had the vision of the crippled part of the teachers and pastors going into the glove. You'll just have to see that. I don't want to repeat it all. And then now, recently, the gold is being poured into the mold. God is building his church upon this rock of revelation that Jesus is the Christ. He will build his church. So there's going to be true doctrine being poured out, and I I believe that God is steering this. Uh, He's concerned with right now the offices of teachers and pastors. So that's what's happening, and uh, it's, it's an exciting thing to be a part of. So where are we right now in this 21 day fast? Where are we right now concerning this vision? And this has been confirmed by several people. On, uh, you know, in the micro church on Periscope, Dr. Robert Nolan um, is saying stuff like this. He was reading someone else, uh, pretty much saying the same thing. Right now, we're at a precipice. There's time no more for being complacent. Being lukewarm right now is not a very good spot to be. Not a very good spot. So there is a challenge that the Lord is laying before the church. He's been saying this since October of 1996. For those of you that don't remember, I talk about this quite often. Uh, Tommy Tinney was at Christian Tabernacle in October of 1996. He's the one that wrote the book, The God Chasers, which was a bestseller. In the first chapter of that book, he talks about the experience where God came into the sanctuary and Pastor Heard was about to get Tommy to speak, and he was nervous. He says, man, you know, I'm a little nervous here. The presence of God here is here. So Pastor Herb went up to the podium, and he read Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Pastor Herb was thrown back at the same time 
the, the pulpit was lifted up, uh, and a, cloud, a loud clap of thunder came in and split the plexiglass pulpit in two. This is when God is saying pretty much the clock is ticking. America, the American church, if my people, or you do this, then I'll heal your, heal your land. So the challenge is before us now. Um, we need to actually take the things of God seriously and step up. And, um, yeah, so Ezekiel 37, the dry bones, it's time to come together, and we can no longer be complacent. Amen? I've gone a long time here. I'll probably talk about speaking the truth in love in the next podcast, hopefully. Um, a little behind, so I will try to get to that. God bless you. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.